Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. And you can learn more about that at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Paneeth Upadia. He works as a, des- as a design assurance engineer and is co-host of the It's a Material World podcast. He also helps material science and engineering graduates land their dream jobs, or at least a job. <laughs> I'm, interested, <laughs> I'm interested to learn more about his interest in material science and engineering, what design insurance t- entails, and the motivation to help people get jobs. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Beneath. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So I I saw from your background that you got a bachelor's and a master's in material science and engineering. What motivated you to get those degrees? Yeah, so with material science and engineering, that stemmed from high school. My dad enrolled me into a nanotechnology Duke tip course. And from there, I learned more about all the potential of nanotechnology, of nanomaterials, for example, the Lysurgis cup. And since then, I realized that nanomaterials, it's a way for the smallest things to have the biggest impact. And so I kind of fell in love with that idea, right? Um, Started having kind of, you know, this dream of potentially having nanobots that kill cancer cells, right? Um, And then from there on, the larger scope of that field is material science and engineering. Did a summer course with at NC State with material science and engineering. And that's what led to ultimately choosing MSc at Georgia Tech. And then from there, um, about two or three years down the line, it made sense for me to pursue a five years combined bachelor's and master's program within the same field. When your father enrolled you in that program, is that something you were happy about? (laughs) <laughs> At that point, I, I was probably lazier than I am now. So I was definitely on the fence about that. I I didn't really want to have something, a commitment, a full on commitment in, in our summer when it's supposed to be a break. But I'm definitely grateful for that now. Um, I really enjoyed the course and really enjoyed learning about what this this amazing up and coming field is. I was lazy as a child as well. <laughs> and I ended up actually studying engineering because my father said I should. When I finished high school, I had no clue what I wanted to do. And he said, do engineering. And I, because I had no other idea, I said, all right, engineering it is. And then I went into materials engineering. Actually, I got a degree in materials engineering too. Awesome. So I, I went into materials engineering, not really knowing what it is. I actually went into it because the one, the, 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 the major that I wanted to was already oversubscribed. So I would have been on a waiting list. And there was no waiting list for materials. So that's <laughs> that's how I ended up there. I mean, yeah. It, it was just, it, it had nothing to do with anything. It just had to do with circumstances. It, <laughs> it, it actually worked out okay. It's not as if I'm upset that I got a degree in materials, uh, material science and engineering. It actually turned out to be pretty interesting. So, I mean, I guess life works out sometimes for you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. I also just realized I really like chemistry and I think materials engineering is kind of uh, a lot of chemistry and then a blend of physics as well. So um, yeah, I think it works out for me as well. Absolutely. So I mentioned in the intro that you're a design assurance engineer. What does design design assurance entail? Yes. So design assurance engineering is similar to quality engineering in the way where we ensure that our products, I work at a medical device company called Boston Scientific. So we ensure our cardiology related medical devices are performing up to standard, both in terms of safety and performance. And so we work with different risk management documentation. We take into account um, any feedback from our users and just ensure that it, it is, you know, medical devices they're operating within our human body. So we have to make sure that uh, they're always safe and never, you know, impacting the patient. So um, in a negative way. So that is kind of what design assurance is about. And in that, there are some times where we make design changes to make sure to improve the imp- the performance as much as possible. Okay. So I so <laughs> funny enough, 
when I worked as an engineer, I also worked in, in medical devices, but I worked in product development. So the people that were in quality and regulatory affairs, I couldn't stand them. <laughs> the, the answer was always no. It's always, you got to do this, you got to change this, you got to do that. It's like, oh man, can we, what is the thing that's actually going to get out there in the market? But no, I can't get out <laughs> in the, the damn market because the regulatory people says that we can't, we can't, we can't be marketed under this, you know, for this, for this function. The quality people say it doesn't pass spec. It's like, come on, man. <laughs> I, I just want to, I want to design things. I want to make, I want to do cool things in, in the labs and stuff. And, and you people keep saying no. <laughs> yeah. And so, so here in Boston Scientific, we actually work, you know, hand in hand with uh, research and development. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I definitely understand that. Right. And, you know, we want to advance each project as efficiently as possible. Um, but there's that balance too of understanding that there's a reason why there's these specs in place, why there's these standards in place and everything like that. So sometimes we have to be the bad guy there. Yeah, sometimes. Sure. <laughs> you know, I, was, I mentioned in the intro also that uh, your platform, it's a material world. What was the motivation to start it? <laughs> that was um, a pandemic related project or it stemmed from the pandemic. Um, my co-host at the time, Tom and I, our internship at GE got pushed back um, and it was postponed. And so we didn't really have anything to do while we were just sitting around. And so we wanted to start a material science podcast more so for fun, but also we realized that there wasn't really a ton of material science related content out there at the time. And so we wanted to showcase what this field is all about to the general public and encourage you know younger students to get involved in the field as a means to change the world. You know, there's, as you mentioned, when you were in high school, you don't really know what you wanted to do. And I think that was similar for me and several other students. So when kind of deciding on that path, you know, having as many resources out there, we just wanted to be one of those resources and really, you know, provide that vote for material science. That was smart that you decided to do that, Panit, because, you know, when you think of engineering, I don't think many people think of material science and engineering and you know, you maybe think, you know, chemical, electrical, mechanical, those are more of the classical engineering disciplines, but material, material science and engineering sometimes doesn't even get its own department within a university. They might be affiliated with one of those other classical disciplines, so it might get overlooked. But it, as I mentioned, I mean, I ended up in it sort of through <laughs> circumstance, but as I said, it, it wasn't something that I was upset with afterwards. It, 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 it actually it worked out really well. So it's great that you that you created this podcast what do you hope people get from the podcast yeah so with the podcast we are the core audience is younger students so probably between the age range of 17 to 28 so it's college students as well as uh early career professionals makes up the majority of our audience and with that we want to provide as much advice as possible um, regarding, you know, career development or academics, you know, how to perform well in classes, how to e excel in your job search, et cetera. But outside of that, primarily we bring on guests from industry or academia to really talk about what they're passionate about, talk about their work, whether it's, you know, the startup they helped found or the research they're doing in their lab. And we want to show exactly what their field is about. And then for our audience, you know, they can just be exposed to multiple arenas within the field, multiple niches, because material science is very versatile. You can make an impact in aerospace, medical devices, as I just mentioned, sustainability, automotives, et cetera. And so with that, you have a lot of options and we just want to kind of provide more info so that hopefully you as a listener can resonate with some of them and then narrow down your choice after your, you know, collegiate career comes to an end and you're kind of looking for that next step. That's, that's, that's wonderful because I mean, I, as I mentioned, you, you can study material science and engineering, then you get this degree and, and now what, where do I, what do I do with this? And it's great if you could, can, tune into a podcast where you can hear from different people that may have that same degree and are working in various industries and you can figure, okay, you can go into this industry with a material science and engineering degree or that one. That's, that's excellent that they have that, that you, that you provide that for people so they Thank can you. make more informed decisions as to what they do afterwards. Because, you know, once you finish that, especially if you didn't do internships, if you do finish that degree and 
now it's kind of like you know, like I said, now what? what I got I got this degree, and, and, <laughs> and not only that, it, it may be in, in 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 an engineering discipline that others may not be all that familiar with. I mentioned chemical, electrical, mechanical. People have heard those names before, but material science. Where do I stick this person? Now you can listen to this. You listen to your podcast, and you, and you can think, well, you can stick me here because this person got this degree, and and they're doing this, and or over here, that you know, and you mentioned it, it is a lot more versatile. I think people give it credit for. So kudos to you for for, for creating that platform. I appreciate that, Neil. I really do. So now, you know, I, you know, Panitha, I started this podcast a couple of you know a few years ago, pre pandemic actually, and it had to do with my own struggles working at the same medical device company where I had to deal with quality engineers like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I had to give presentations on a monthly basis on project status updates to senior management. And I wasn't very good at it at first. It was it was actually really rather embarrassing how bad I was. Luckily, the other engineers weren't all that much better at it than mm-hmm. I was. So it's not as if I stood I stood out in that way. But I certainly saw the benefit of getting better at giving presentations in front of these people. When it, 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 at least in in your career so far, when did you realize the benefit of becoming effective at communicating with others? Yeah, it's always been prominent. I think since day one, it's important to develop, you know, good relationships with with your team members, with your managers. And um, in terms of communicating status updates, you have to be as clear and concise as possible. I think when it really stood out was my first leadership opportunity, like project management related opportunity within my role as a design assurance engineer. I was operating more from, you know, coordinating team meetings and being able to move the project forward and then communicate those status updates with management since it was, you know, a high visibility project at that time. And at that point was when it when it became very evident that certain people care about the minutia less and then some maybe more technical professionals care about those details about you know the results of each study etc more and more so i have to be able to fine tune my presentations to each type of audience and so i just think it's super important to recognize who your audience is and then be able to communicate exactly what they need as efficiently as possible as I mentioned, I wasn't very good at giving these presentations at first, but I saw the benefit of, of getting better at it, and I did so. Have you always been good at giving presentations or public speaking in general? And if not, what did you do to get better? <laughs> Definitely not. I would say that it's still something I am actively working on, even through the podcast, thinking about exactly what I'm saying, filler words, etc. So in order to get better, it, the best thing for me was practice, just putting myself in those situations to continuously give those presentations and then be able to reflect afterwards and see, oh, here's where I could get better, whether that's recording the presentation itself or just taking 15, 20 minutes to think about it. You know, we can do something over and over again, but if we're not making the adjustments, then you're less likely to improve or you can improve at an accelerated rate if you take that time to reflect and then actively make that adjustment the next time. So honestly, it was practice, practice, practice. And then also I think listening to other presentations as well and being able to take into account, Oh, here's what they did. Well, you know, even if that's a technical podcast, right. Just thinking about, Oh, here's how they speak. Just even hearing you speak, Neil, I think you're a great speaker and it's something that I've learned. Oh, okay. I can take, you know, silence is okay, for example, and you're you're very straightforward, straight to the point. And it's just something that I can learn from. So just being able to learn from other people and be able to implement it into your own public speaking style. Thanks for the compliment. And I've done over 230 episodes of this podcast mm-hmm. at this point. So I hope I've improved since that first <laughs> one. If not, then I'm, just, I'm, I'm messing up bad. <laughs> you also mentioned the filler words. It's funny you mentioned filler words because I, I am on LinkedIn quite a bit. And I did a poll last month, so in December, about the use of filler words and how damaging or not damaging they are to technical presentations. So the question I asked was, when it comes to a technical presentations, how important are, are filler words? And I had the three three options. They are something you should work to, to eliminate, don't worry about them, and then other. And work to eliminate them 
overwhelmingly was the number one response of the people who who participated in the poll. And even the idea of where the poll came from was actually from this podcast. I had a guest on maybe a couple of years ago and mm-hmm. my mother called me after the episode aired because she listens to, I guess she listens to some of my episodes and <laughs> she said that she couldn't get through the episode because the guest used too many filler words. She found it too distracting. So after maybe a couple of minutes, she stopped listening and got me thinking how important really are filler words when it comes to presentations, especially if you're giving presentations in front of a group that really needs to hear what you have to say. If you're not using or if you are using a ton of filler words are you turning them off and they're then not getting the information that you want to impart but then on the other hand people often talk about being your authentic self especially at work and if if using filler words as part of your natural parlance just how you naturally talk is eliminating them telling you to to not be your authentic self so i mentioned this in the in the in the poll so i'm really curious to see how people would comment and then how that might change their their, I guess their decision on whether they they think that filler words are something to be avoided or not. Yeah, I agree. I think that they're part of your natural self, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can't improve upon that. We've had that similar instance whenever with, with our podcast episodes, there were times, even with myself, when I was listening back to myself, I was thinking, oh, I use um, uh, like a lot. And then that was an area for improvement, but also with other hosts or guests, it was something where we actively would want our editors, for instance, to be able to remove those filler words, because especially when it's audio only, they become more prominent. When it's video, then you have other cues and the filler words you can kind of bypass and you can still consume the rest of the episode. But similar to your story, it becomes a lot harder when there's an um or there's a like after every single word or after every other word. So I think it's something to improve. Definitely. You can distract from the overall message when there's a lot of ums, uhs, likes, et cetera. Yeah, I think you're right. And plus, you know, I mentioned the argument of if you, if you try to minimize them, then you're not being your authentic self. Well, you could use that argument for anything really and, and never improve on anything. Well, this exactly. is just how I am. It's my, my authentic <laughs> self. So you got to take it, take it or leave it. It's like, then you never improve on anything. It's, it's, <laughs> so it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine to use that as an excuse. So I agree. Pet, so, absolutely. <laughs> so when it comes to the presentations that you do, do you have a process for putting them together? And if so, what is it? Yeah, so I think that the process that we use is similar to something we learned in my Capstone Project class where the title of the slide for instance, is the key point. The Instead of just, oh, here's the background, here's results, like that's the title of the slide, we make it the point of, you know, X percent of, et cetera, right? Something like the key takeaway. And then the rest is more so the key information. And then I just think that if there is other information presented on the slide outside of what I'm talking about, it's hard for to understand both, but if they work hand in hand, then it works really well. So the slide, the information on the slide should be the same as the information that I'm saying, or it should be a compliment without distracting from the my presentation or exactly what I'm talking about. So that's kind of the format that I use. And then this is just something that I learned from my co-host, David, but I like to include at the bottom of a slide, just the, like the section that we're at in the presentation. You know, if there's like, uh, it's almost like a table of contents, but it's on every slide. And then it highlights, here's at the, here's the part where we're at. So it just gives the audience an idea of, oh, here's where we're at in the presentation. We're near the end. We're discussing the main results or, oh, we're still at the background section. So there's more to the presentation. So those are just some of the first things that came to mind when I give a presentation is just giving the audience a full picture of where we're at and what are the key takeaways, because you can only consume and understand so much. And I feel like there's a certain percentage that the audience really takes away from a presentation after 15, 20 minutes, et cetera. I think that's an excellent point that you brought up about the making the title essentially what you want to convey to the audience, especially to an audience that doesn't know as much about your 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 topic as you do. I 
I, I can even remember the presentations I had to give in front of those senior managements. And you could have a bunch of slides with, with a bunch of text on them or a bunch of, of graphs and charts. And they're probably looking at these like, what am I supposed to get from this chart? What am I supposed to get from this table? But if the title is exactly what you're supposed to get from that chart or that table, then they don't have to think so much about what they have to get from it. They know exactly what it is because it's in black and white. And I think that's I think that's really smart. So that's something you should definitely continue to do. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had any advice outside of what I mentioned. Just I'm always trying to learn. So if there's anything that you would add, I would love to incorporate it into my future presentations at work or in any other setting. Sure. So I like to start presentations with the end in mind. What is the essentially what is the call to action? What do I want people to do after they listen to this presentation? And then I work backwards. So once I figure out what that call to action is, I then have to figure out what points do I need to hit to that will naturally funnel to that call to action. And 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 essentially that's 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 really what it is and that's really helped me a lot just trying to fight, try to figure out what to say during presentations and it also helps to eliminate anything that is extraneous any it, so you don't have any fluff in the in the presentation. You have exactly what these people need to then which then leads to that call to action. I love that. Yeah, cuz we have a call to action on our podcast but there's there's going to be a call to action really with any technical presentation otherwise you know there's there's just a purpose right and so understanding what is that ultimate message that you want to send helps create the rest of the presentation. So, thank you. I really appreciate that. That's something I'll definitely incorporate moving you, forward. You damn right the guys to be a purpose for the presentation. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't put this thing together take the time to put this thing together just to just to get up there and sweat profusely <laughs> in front of all these senior management people just for nothing. No, exactly. you, you got to do something after this. I <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But absolutely. It's, on, it's on me to it's on me to make it clear what that something is, and mm -hmm. and that's that's definitely something that I didn't do initially, but it's something I I certainly started doing eventually. <laughs> nice, nice. So now, <laughs> when it comes to the presentations that you do, do you ever get nervous before them? And if so, how do you deal with your nerves? I definitely get nervous, um, and I think one thing that I've implemented recently is meditation. Um, and it's something that I try to do as often as possible, but I particularly have done it before significant big presentations. And it just helps clear my mind and really just also visualize how I want the presentation to go. So the last time I had a big presentation with a big call to action, just being able to, you know, put my phone away, sit down, close my eyes and just you know, let the thoughts flow. Um, I was also able to just visualize in my head, oh, here's exactly how I want to start this presentation. Here's how I think it'll go with the questions that I think will get asked. And then here's how we'll make the ultimate decision, right? And I just visualized how that entire meeting would go. And then to see it kind of come to fruition with the presentation, I just felt a lot calmer going into it because I knew exactly how it was going to go. I already played it in my mind. So that was just something that has worked recently for me. Um, but also in addition to that before I would always, you know, have a deep breath exercise, um, you know, just in through the nose, out through the mouth, uh, four or five times, big, deep breaths. And then that kind of calms the heart rate down, keeps me focused, keeps me locked in. Wow. Man, have you sat through one of my presentations, Puneet? You mentioned something that I talk <laughs> about all the time. is the idea of visualizing yourself doing the presentation and visualizing how you how things are going to go and, and, and anticipating questions and being comfortable not knowing the answer and, and being comfortable saying you don't know the answer. So, man, when I first started giving presentations, I used to lie through my teeth when I didn't know the <laughs> answer sometimes. But it was it was bad to do it because I was talking to people who didn't know as much on the subject that I did. So I figured I could finesse my way through the presentation, through the, at least through the questions, the Q&A part. Because, I mean, how are they going to know I'm lying? But every now and then, you get caught out there, and it's like, oh, crap, they, 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 they called my bluff. But yeah. I, I'm a, I'm firm, I firmly believe in visualizing success. And just when you do that, as you mentioned, now you're a better frame of mind to go into the presentation. And I'm a big fan of the breathing as well. It's just shallow breaths, man, you go pass out. You, got, <laughs> you, got, you definitely got to breathe. Do that diaphragm, get your heart rate, you know, at a steady rate so that you finally get up there and, and you do what you got to do. So I'm, I, I firmly agree with what you said. So exactly. now, if someone were to listen to this, this podcast or watch the video on YouTube and they, they're, they're, they're set on becoming more effective 
at giving presentations or, or just public speaking in general, what's the number one tip you could give them to, to do that? Yeah, and this is somewhat tied to this idea of visualizing success. But one thing that I love to do is uh, I have like a journal filled with uh, <clears throat> things that I'm grateful for, as well as manifestations as well. Those are for bigger goals, but I think it works well for your smaller goals as well. So even just writing down what you want uh, and kind of visualizing, manifesting that success, then you kind of work every day towards making that a reality. And then you just operate in a better mindset when you're reading things, rereading things that you're grateful for each and every day. Um, so that's a, a little bit less related to public speaking specifically, but I think that similar to what you were talking about in your seminars and within this podcast, visualizing success, it's something that you have to practice day in and day out um, if you want to continuously improve. And so reminding yourself of that goal is imperative. And I think the best way to remind yourself is by writing it in a journal and, and rereading it each and every day. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Just the, 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 the exercise of putting it down on paper. And so now it's, 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 it's permanent, it's tangible. You can actually see it as opposed to it being in your mind and maybe you forget. And I will forget because I'm a forgetful person. <laughs> it's like, what, what was that goal again? I know exactly what that goal again was because I can go back to the journal and look in it and see what that goal is. And I can get myself, you know, going back towards you know meeting that goal. So that's an, that's an excellent tip. This has been a great conversation, Panit. Thank you again for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, Puneet Upadhyay. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm the only name, uh, Puneet Upadhyay, on LinkedIn. So that's the best way to connect with me. And then if you want to tune into our podcast, It's a Material World, we're on every platform, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, et cetera. So again, Neil, I really appreciate you inviting me on the show. It means a lot. And I really enjoyed this conversation. Wonderful. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson, founder of Teach the Geek, and you can learn more about it at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Panit. Yep. Thanks.